Let's um, read, we're picking up in, in our Gospel of John, this journey through the Gospel of John, in the middle of a conversation Jesus is having with this woman at the well, and it picks up in verse 16. Actually, I, I'm going to go back to verse 15, um, just so it kind of gives a little bit of context for us as we read through. So let's pick up in verse 15. It says, The woman said to him, to Jesus, Sir, give me this water so that I may not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying you have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. Your worship, you worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming. He who is called the Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Well, as I said, uh, this morning we, we kind of pick up this conversation that Jesus is having here. Um, but it, so it's between Jesus and this Samaritan woman that he meets at a well. Now, just to kind of give you some background on that in case you missed last week. Um, Jesus is traveling. He's down, he was down in uh, Jerusalem in Judea. Uh, for, for some of the Jewish festivals and things. And now he's traveling north to Galilee to his home base for ministry. And to do that, he has to pass through this area of Samaria. So as he's going through, he stops near this uh, village or town of Sychar, and there's a well there. And it's midday, and he's tired, and he's hot, and so he stops there for a rest and sends his disciples in to uh, go get some food. And while he's there, a woman comes by herself, to draw water from the well, and that is where Jesus and her start this conversation. And um, if you remember, uh, we, we kind of talked about this. It was a little unusual, some things happening, not just because Jesus, who was a man, was speaking to a woman one-on-one, -on -one, which was not done in the culture of that day, but even bigger than that, Jesus was a Jew, and this woman was a Samaritan. And as we talked about last week, there's quite a history between the Jews and the Samaritans. That goes back several hundred years even before this. And if you want to get all that history, we talked about it last week, so I'm not going to go over it. So just, just suffice it to say, but because of this history they had, that the Jews looked down on the Samaritans, and because of that, the Samaritans resented the Jews. So there was this hatred between the two, and they wanted nothing to do with each other. And they, the, the Samaritans really didn't like the Jews from the area of Judea and Samaria. I mean, Judea and Galilee, which kind of bracketed Samaria. So this is kind of what's happening. Nonetheless, despite all of this, um, he, he asked this woman for a drink. But instead of just receiving a drink, Jesus offers the woman something, a different kind of water, living water, that if one drinks this water, they will never thirst again. And what Jesus is doing here is he's sharing the good news of salvation, salvation through him with this woman. And last week, what we learned from all of this is, is how Jesus shared this living water with this woman or introduced it to or the importance of it and also how we can then share this good news, this living water with our world today. And we, we learn some things from that. Now from this the, and from verse 15 where we started, the conversation pivots from the importance of this living water to then how then do I receive this living water? So again, we see in verse 15, Jesus shares all of this, and the woman says, give me this water, right? I want this water so that I won't have to be thirsty again. I won't have to come here and draw water. Now, we're not sure what's happening here. Does this woman really truly understand all that Jesus is saying? Probably not. But it's still okay because she's showing that I'm thirsty, and I know I need something. 
And sometimes we look at that, and as, as Christians even today, we, we look down on that and say, but she doesn't have any. Now, she doesn't know what she's talking about. Well, think of new believers. Sometimes we look at new believers, and we expect them to have knowledge of all things when they come to Christ. And when they come, a lot of times we just have a kernel, and we know we're thirsty. And just like um, we just sang in the, in the song right before this message, you know, we're, we're beggars, now we're royalty. All we knew is we were beggars, now we're royalty. We don't understand the deep theology. We grow in that. So this woman is showing this kind of basic desire and saying, I want this water to drink. And she knows she's thirsty for something that she lacks. So Jesus then changes this focus from talking about the importance of living water to how this woman can quench her thirst, right? Or receive this living water and never thirst again. And what Jesus shares with her also helps us. It helps us know how to receive the living water of Jesus, the good news, but also how to help others find this. As we share the good news with others, how do we kind of close the deal or, or get people to that point of a decision and, and place their trust or receive salvation? And that's all in this passage this morning, and as Jesus explained it. So let's kind of um, unpack some of these things about this conversation as it continues. So look at verse 16. So again, Jesus, uh, this woman expressed her desire for water, and Jesus takes that desire for, for, for that she wants this living water, and he says, go get your husband, <laughs> and then come to me. And you say, well, what's going on here? Well, we're never told why Jesus is calling for her husband to come. It could be because, again, Jesus is a man talking to a woman one-on-one, -on -one, that shouldn't be, so go get your husband, then why didn't he say that at the beginning? Maybe it's that he wants the husband to hear this so he can have living water too. And that's also a possibility. But there's another possibility. Maybe it's because Jesus wants to expose something that needs to come to light. Right? He's trying to, he's trying to reveal something that this woman wanted to keep hidden. And as we continue in this passage, I kind of think this is what Jesus is doing here and calling for the husband, right? Right? He wants to bring to light something. Remember, one of the themes of John is that, that Jesus is light, and the light overcomes the darkness, and the darkness doesn't, you know, the darkness doesn't like the light and wants to stay in the dark. And so this whole idea of Jesus bringing something to light kind of fits with John's viewpoint of Jesus here. So this is what he's doing. He's saying, go get your, go get your husband, because he knows what's going to happen here. And the woman, she tells Jesus what we come to find is a true statement about herself, and that is, I have no husband. She isn't married. And while that's technically true, it isn't exactly the whole truth, is it? You, you ever see those court shows, tell me the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? We can tell the truth without telling the whole truth, can't we? And this is what this woman's doing. So she's keeping something back. And she says, well, I don't have a husband. That should suffice. But Jesus being God in the flesh, God himself, he knows better, right? He knows the, the whole truth. So he reveals it to her. He says, yeah, you're correct. You have no husband, but you've had five. And you're living with the guy right now who isn't your husband. You know, there are times I wish that Jesus had an official photographer kind of going along with him in ministry. You know, and taking pictures of Jesus in ministry. Because I would have loved to see this woman's face when Jesus says this. You know, she says, well, I don't have a husband. And it's kind of nice and everything. And Jesus is like, I know, you've had five. And the guy you're living with right now isn't your husband. I mean, shock and all, I guess, is the, the, the response we kind of have here, right? And, and kind of like, whoa. And we're not, why does Jesus bring this up? Or why is this the case with this woman? How has she had five husbands and now... She's, so she isn't married to these five guys, and now she's living with a guy who's not married. We're not told what the story is. We don't know, did she have infidelity on them, and they all divorced her because of this infidelity? Did they have infidelity with her? Were, did they just abandon her? Or maybe she's a widow. And that may explain why this sixth guy won't marry her. He values his life, right? We're not told. We're not told why she has gone through five husbands and is living with this sixth husband. And sometimes when we read, we read scripture and there's something unsaid and we said, why didn't they tell us that? It's because that's not the important issue here. 
John is telling you the important issue. So if we don't have that, don't get hung up on that. Here's the important issue. Whether it's that she's widowed five times over or that she had infidelity with these, these five, you know, five men and now is... The, the idea is she's a woman that's carrying around a lot of shame, a lot of regret, embarrassment because she's not sharing the whole truth, and she is in sin. Even if she didn't have infidelity with the other five... She's living with the guy who isn't her husband, so at the very least, she is in sin. And that's what Jesus is bringing out here, right? Is that even if it, she's, she's living with this sixth guy, so at the very least, sin is present in her life. And shame is present in her life. Now, it is never fun to have our sin exposed, is it? Have you ever had your sin exposed? Do you ever get caught doing something? It's kind of like when you're speeding and, you, and the cop comes up behind you. What's your first thing? You want to, you want to, to oh, I didn't do it. Or you're just like, oh, you want to hide. And sometimes we, we might do something and somebody bring, calls us on it, you know, call us out on our sin. It's something maybe we're trying to hide and somebody knew about it and they call it. We don't want to hear that, do we? That's not fun. That's not fun to hear and it's not easy. Maybe something that's shameful or embarrassing and they bring up and you're just like, oh, why did you? Well, that's what happens here. Except it's not just anyone pointing out this sin. It's Jesus, God in the flesh, pointing out this sin. And she doesn't know this, but if God is pointing out your sin, that's not good. <laughs> you know, you really can't hide from that. And, and we, we need to remember with the Jews and the Samaritans, the, the Samaritans read God's word. They followed the Pentateuch, God's law, as well as the Jews. They were very pious people as well. They were a little misguided in some of their worship and things like that. But they were pious people as well. So this woman, it's not that the Samaritans were lawless. They actually would line up. So if she's doing this, even among her own people, she's in the wrong. And this could be a reason why she's having to come to the well alone instead of as in a group like most people did. And coming during midday is she's kind of this outcast. So even in her standards, she's in sin. And she knows it, Okay. Now, it, again, it might not be fun to have our sin exposed and, and some of these things are revealed, but it's necessary because it's this revelation that exposes her great need and her epic failure. What it shows is, yeah, you think you're thirsty, you're more thirsty than you, than you could ever know. You're flawed, you're weak, you're unworthy. And she kind of knows this. Yet Jesus is going to use this not to make her feel bad about herself, but rather to bring her closer to his living water, to salvation in him. In fact, this is kind of the first step that we see in receiving God's salvation, that living water, where this woman and, and really all of our thirst is quenched. Sins are forgiven and, and our longing is satisfied. It's this. What we learn here is that our thirst is quenched with living water when we first of all confront the reality of our sin. And here's what we see. See, what we see in this passage is there's three times that this woman tries to deflect or tries to hide something. And this is the first one. And the first thing she tries to hide is her sin. And Jesus exposes this. Why? Because she needs to confront the reality of her sin. It's important that this woman and really all of us confront this reality that we are sinners. And not only that we are sinners, but what sin really is and what the effects of sin are. Paul, Paul reminds us in Romans 3, he says, all have sinned, right? Every single person has sinned. If you're a human being, save Jesus. We are born sinners and we sin. Every one of us. Now, what is sin when we talk about sin? Here's what sin is in a nutshell. It's anything that we do that goes against what God has commanded or what God desires. So we disobey God. Man's original sin is this, right? Adam and Eve, they ate of the fruit of the tree that God prohibited them from eating. He said, don't eat the, the fruit of that tree. And they say, well, we're going to do it anyway. That's sin. But sin is even more than this. James tells us this about sin. There's another aspect of sin that sometimes we may forget. He says, so whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. So it's not only what we do that's sin, but it's things we should be doing that we don't do that is also sin. So if we know we should be 
loving our neighbor and we're not loving our neighbor, that is sin. You see how all that works? If God says, honor your father and mother, and you're not honoring your father and mother, then guess what? It's sin. So it's, it's not only what we do, but it's the things we fail to do that God wants us to do. And sin is a big deal. Beyond just exposing our weaknesses and failures, you, you know what sin does? It exposes our rebellion against God. Sometimes we never think of that, do we? That sin is rebellion against God. We're basically making ourselves God's enemy. I don't know about you, but I don't want God against me. He's a, the, the, the creator of the universe, the sustainer of all things, more powerful than anything. Nothing is impossible for him. He can do anything. He can bring life. He can take life. He can do all that. I don't want that against me. I don't want him against me. But yet that's what sin does. It pits us against God. It says, I want my will and my way, not your will and your way. And it puts us at odds with God. And that is a very scary place to be. Yet it's only here when we understand how scary it is that we see the hopelessness of our condition and our great need for our Savior. In fact, this is what Paul goes on to say. After, John, after Romans 3 and Romans 6, he says this, For the wages of sin or the result of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through who? Jesus Christ, our Lord. Our sin, yours and mine, it brings death. In fact, unresolved sin, unforgiven sin, dooms us to hell when we die. And you know, that's not often talked about, is it? You know, a lot of times we're just like, man, I come to church, I come to church to hear about joy and peace and hope and all of these great things. What is he talking about this for? Well, because we can't know joy and peace and hope until we confront the reality of our own sin. And we need to know that sin is a real issue. It's such a big issue that God himself came to earth to deal with it. In Jesus, he came to take our sin once and for all. That's why sin is a big deal. And Jesus exposes this in this woman. So now she has to confront the reality of our sin. And Jesus, the, and then the conversation then continues. And look at verse 19. So this conversation between Jesus and this woman continues. Jesus has kind of brought out this sin that she thought was hidden, but yet Jesus knew it because Jesus is God. And this woman... In verse 19, it says something interesting. Here's how she replies. She said, sir, I perceive you're a prophet. Now, again, we don't know how she's saying this. Is she saying it sarcastically? Or, man, look at you. You think you're so smart. You know, who told you this? Or she's really saying, hey, this is a guy sent from God. He knows things about me that I could never know. And that's, that's kind of a neat revelation that comes. And, but yet... She doesn't really get it yet. It's not enough just to have her sin exposed because, again, we don't like our sin exposed. So watch what she does now. She pivots a little bit. She admits that Jesus is a prophet, and maybe she's buttering up on all these things that we don't know. But what she does then is change the subject. So Jesus brings out the sin. They should talk about it. But instead she goes, you know, you're a prophet. Let me bring up something. And she changes subjects and brings up this hotly debated topic of contention between the Jews and the Samaritans about worship. You know what this is kind of like? You know, you're talking to somebody and you bring it around to the spiritual things in life and they sit there and go, where do you stand on gun control? Because why? Everybody's got an opinion on it. Or abortion. Health care. You know... The homosexual debate. Everybody has an opinion on that, and it changes the subject. Do you ever have somebody do that to you? And they just want to take it, and they want to take it to this, this hotly, and we're going to talk about this in a minute, of why, why we tend to do that and why people tend to do that. But what she does is she brings up this hotly debated topic of worship between the Jews and the Samaritans. And she notes, she says, you know, the Samaritans, we worshiped at this mountain. And there's a mountain right outside Sikar called Mount Gerizim. And that was where they had a temple, and they would worship God there. And he says, while you worship in Jerusalem. So now he's, she's lumping Jesus in with all the Jews and says, you worship in Jerusalem. 
what is all this debate about? It goes all the way back to where the kingdom, the Israelites split into two nations that we talked about last week between the northern kingdom and the, and the southern kingdom. And if you remember, Solomon, the last king of the United Kingdom, um, built this glorious temple to God in Jerusalem for everybody to worship. So all of the Israelites would come for all the feasts and come to Jerusalem to worship. Now they've split between north and south, right? You have Judah and you have Israel. Rehoboam is the king of the southern kingdom, Judah, and Jeroboam is now the king of the northern kingdom. They don't like each other. They're trying to say, we're better than you, you're better than us, you know, all these things, right? And he notices, hey, all our people keep going down to Jerusalem to worship. You know, they go down there so often. What if they go down there and they just say, we don't want to make this trip so much. Why don't we just move down there? And then he loses people, which means he loses power. So he says, we got to keep our people here. So let's build our own place of worship on our own mountain. And they pick Mount Gerizim. Mount Gerizim actually has some significance because it's where um, one of the last times uh, Moses brought the people of God together before he dies, and he brought them together to go over God's covenant, it was on Mount Gerizim. So they say, it's a holy place. So they're worshiping on this holy place. So now you have these two places of worship for the Jews. Because remember, the Samaritans are also Jews, right? And they have these two places of worship. And then what happens is the woman uses the past tense there. She goes, you worship in Jerusalem. We worshiped on this mountain. Why is it worshiped? Well, because after the captivity, after the Israelites came back from captivity, and you had the ones that really wanted to follow God again, and they're, they're down there in Jerusalem and, and Judea, and, and they're wanting to follow God, and they see that the Samaritans have this mountain, and they said that's not right for them to do that. So you know what they did? They went up there and they destroyed the temple. So the Samaritans couldn't worship there anymore. That's why she's using past tense. Again, makes a lot of contention there, right? So um, there's animosity. There's much debate over which mount was the true place of worship. And again, why is the woman bringing up this debate? She could have been curious, sure, but that's, more, that's unlikely. Rather, she's changing the subject to take the focus off of herself. And in doing that, What's she, what she kind of reasoning here? And let's look at the reasoning. You, you see, Jesus is a Jew, so undoubtedly he's going to take the Jewish viewpoint on this, which is not her viewpoint or her people's viewpoint. So immediately she says, well, I don't agree with you, so now I don't have to listen to you. You see, you said something offensive, so you've just lost all ability to speak into my life. And she can write them off. You know, and maybe she can point out, she could excuse her own sin and having to deal with her own sin, pointing out, well, you, you did this, but now you're showing yourself. You're judgmental and you're hateful. You're closed-minded to all of this stuff. Does any of that sound familiar to you with what happens in our world today when we share Jesus with our world? It's kind of a tactic of not wanting to confront the reality of our sin, isn't it? We want to deflect. We want to, we want to uh, disarm when somebody does that. But we need to remember, we're not bringing this up so people can attack us all they want. We're bringing up God's truth. So we come under this too. But sometimes you bring that up, right? And you see hot debates in our world today. Uh, subjects like abortion or, or transgenderism or homosexuality. And, 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 you know, we start to make a strong case for Christ and then people say, well, where do you stand on this? And once you make a stand on it, and once you give an opinion on it, or what God's word says about it, they say, you're a hateful person, you're a racist, you're closed-minded, you're one of these Christians. And I don't have to listen to you. You're judgmental. You sin too. So who are you to say? Any, anybody ever say things like that to you? You're calling me a sinner, but you're a sinner, so I don't need to listen to you. Well, what is that? how does that affect you being a sin, sinner that I sin? You see, here's the difference between our sin and our sin. And the world's sin. We don't want to sin. We feel guilty when we sin, don't we? When we sin, we say, I know it's wrong. This is why Jesus died, and I'm praying for his strength that I don't do this anymore. We're not saying, I sin, and I want it celebrated and accepted by everybody. That's the difference. But again, our world is great, and, and Satan is great at, de at deflecting some of these things and to get us off subject and get us uh, falling back and getting defensive. And this is what this woman's kind of doing with Jesus and trying to paint him in a corner so she can give herself an excuse not to listen to this guy. The only problem with that is Jesus doesn't fall for it. 
<laughs> Jesus doesn't fall into that trap. He answers her questions in a way she can't argue with. And then he moves back to the real issue at hand. Look at verse 21. Jesus answers her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem you will worship the Father. You know what he's saying there? He's saying both groups. There's a day coming where both groups are wrong. The Samaritans are wrong for worshiping on this mountain, and the Jews will be wrong for saying this is where we worship God. Because worshiping God is not about a place. So they're both wrong. What? So Jesus is kind of coming out of the Jewish camp here. Why? Because he's over all of this. And he says, they're both wrong. And he says, you know, the Jews who focus worship based on a place are just as wrong as the Samaritans are doing this. Because, again, worshiping God or having a relationship with him isn't about a place. However, Jesus does share a truth with her, doesn't he? He says, you know, you worship what you don't know, but the Jews, we worship what we know because salvation is from the Jews. And that can sound a pretty offensive statement. But we remember the Samaritans have the same Bible. They have the same Old Testament, the same law. They follow the law. And in that law, it's as clear as day. The promise of the Messiah comes through Abraham and it comes through the tribe of Judah. You can't argue with that. Even the Samaritans would agree the Messiah is coming through the line of Judah, who is a Jew. So that's a truth. So Jesus answers her question truthfully in a way that she can't really argue with it. So he kind of gets this and, 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 and brings that out. And he answers in a way that the woman can't really dismiss it. And what he's saying. And then he gets to the heart of the matter in verse 23. So he said the hour is coming. But now the hour is coming and it now is. So he says there's something coming, but it's also happening right now. And what he's doing, he's talking about himself. He has come. When true worshipers, you know what he's talking about then? Those who are acceptable to God, those who have a relationship with God, we can put in from our day, Christians, those who are saved, those who belong to God, will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. In fact, God himself is a spirit. He's not, he's not confined to a place. God is omnipresent, right? And those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. So what is Jesus talking about here? Here's what he's saying. Where a person worships doesn't matter as much as how a person worships. Do you get that? Saying where a person worships, it doesn't matter as much as how a person worships. This is who God accepts and how worship will be judged by worshiping in spirit and in truth. Now, what is Jesus talking about? Now, some of your Bibles may have the word spirit there capitalized. Some might not have it capitalized. Remember, in the original language, there was no capital letters. There was no lowercase letters. And sometimes we can be tempted to say, well, he's talking about the Holy Spirit. Of course, we can't worship God. We can't come to him apart from the Holy Spirit. He's not talking about the Holy Spirit here. What he's talking about is the spirit that is in all of us, our heart, our inner person, the person that we are, that is uniquely created, and God puts that so that we're all unique in that sense. And he says, we worship him in our person, from our heart, personally, and according to his truth. So this worshiper being right with God, it's a personal experience with the unchanging truth of God. Do you see that? Spirit and truth. It's a personal experience within a person with the unchanging truth of God. So here's what we learn. We learn that, that, that then tasting this living water, receiving this living water of salvation, it's not about just confronting our own sin, but it's also about confronting the reality of a personal response. There's a reality here when it comes to having the living water is that it's about a personal response that quenches our thirst. 
God's salvation. It isn't about where a person is from, where they worship, their background, their past, what family they're in, what church they attend, where they live. It's not about being a Jew. It's not about being a Samaritan. It's not about being Greek, Roman, barbarian, or American. It is about an individual and God. See what Jesus is doing here? He's knocking down these walls because she's saying, well, there's a lot that separates us as Jews Jews and Samaritans. Jesus says, it's not about that. It's about you and the Father. We have personal responsibility. It's not doing certain rituals or anything like that. It's a personal, intimate response in the heart of an individual to God, the author of truth. You kind of get that now? You're seeing where he's going with it? It's, it's much like what Joshua did. We talked about Joshua a little bit last week, right? That, that it was actually in this area of Shechem that he did this, where he's, he's getting ready to die and he's calling the children of Israel to keep following God. But he doesn't say, as a nation, follow God. Look what he says. He says, and if it's evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day who you will serve. And again, he's talking to all the people, but he's not talking to them to, to choose corporately who they're going to serve. He says, whether the gods of the fathers, your father served in the region beyond the, region, the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, here's how we know it's personal. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You know what he's saying? This is bigger than being an Israelite. This is about you and God. And will you choose God. And this is what Jesus is doing, saying, hey, God is a spirit. He's everywhere. So you're going to have to stand before him and give an account. You see, sometimes we worship one way or the other. We say, well, I want to worship in spirit. It's all about personal. You know, I have a bunch of fishermen friends that say, oh, I'd rather be out fishing thinking about God than in church thinking about fishing. That's where I commute. No, that's weak, you know, and you're just, oh, it's just this experience where I get, you're not a hippie. I mean, come on. It's, it's not, there has to be truth that goes along with that. You see, when we worship just an experience, what we, what we do is we live our life based on feelings and how it makes me feel. And, oh, I just want to, it's all about love. We hear about that in our, in our world today, don't we? Our culture. It's just about loving each other. But, but if, you, if you hash that out, if everybody's just loving each other and what love is for everybody, it can't logically work. Can it? Why? Because it's, it's separated from truth. You see? And people say, well, I want to be valued, you know, for who I am. And, and, you know, but that doesn't work when you say, well, who you are is up to you and it's just fluid. Well, no. And, and it logically can't work. And it's not just about feelings. And we see this get into the church where, where church and, and our time with God just becomes all feeling driven and all emotion driven. And you're just like, oh, all the ups and downs. Oh, yes. And, and we're living all this. What happens, though, is when we just worship according to spirit and how we feel and we don't have truth, we fall for anything. And we fall for error and we fall for, for missing the point and sin. And we fall into heresy and some of those things. That's dangerous. But you know what's just as dangerous? Worshiping in truth with no spirit. Because then we're just about facts. We see that in our society today where people are just black and white. I don't care. The truth is this. Well, how does that work? Well, I don't care. It's just this. <laughs> You're hammering people over the head with truth and not caring about anybody. And we see this in churches too, don't we? Where churches just want to be about truth, but there's no spirit. And we're not moved We just want to sit up in a tower somewhere and say, we're right and you're wrong. That's just as wrong. When you worship in in truth with no spirit, we become unmovable and stagnant. So we need to be careful about this. Why? Because it's about personal trust. And what Jesus is doing is he's breaking down all of these walls. And this is the beauty of Jesus as the woman of the well, because people are like, Jesus just came for Jews. Here he's saying, no, I've come for people, for individuals. You see, you're a Samaritan, I'm a Jew. It doesn't matter. We worship God in spirit and in truth. And he breaks down these walls that separate the, the Jews and the Samaritans, 
And he does this for us as well. He breaks down those walls. No matter what your background is, no matter what you faced in the past, no matter how rich you were or how great of an upbringing is you had or how poor of an upbringing you've had, you still need to stand before God and have a personal experience or a personal decision based on his truth. You see, there's going to come a day, day when we stand before the judgment seat of God, and you know what? We stand alone. We don't get to take our pastor with us, our parents, our church family, or just our, our, our hollaback crowd. We don't get to take any of that. We stand before God, and he says, what have you done with my truth? It's a personal experience, and it's a personal decision with God based on his truth. So now this woman's starting to believe this. And she's starting to get this. And look at verse 25. And she says it. And she's she's like, all right, I get this. And I'm starting to understand a little bit about what this is about. And she admits knowledge of this coming Messiah. She says, hey, I know the Messiah is coming. And he who's called the Christ. So she has this willingness to believe in the coming Christ. And it seems genuine, genuine, but there's still a touch of deflection here. Because what does she do? I know the Messiah is coming, and I know it's one who's called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. So she's like, I'll have to check it with him. You sound great, but you're just this guy, Jesus. I need to check. When When God himself tells me this. Have you ever been there? If God himself told me to do this, then I would do it. And this is what's happening, right? And she's basically saying, you know, hey, I know you said some revealing stuff and it sounds great, but when Christ comes, I may be ready to listen to all of this. And that's when Jesus drops the hammer. When God himself comes and speaks to me and Jesus says, um, yeah, I, I'm him. Right? He says, I who speak to you am he. So she's like, yeah, that's great. I'll wait for Christ. Well, now, uh, now that you mention it, yeah, I am the Christ. And it's one of those hammer moments. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> I can't run anymore. I can't hide. He is the Christ. Jesus brings it all to a head. You see, to quench her thirst, to, to, to have eternal life, this living water, right? To receive it. This woman and anyone, we must confront our sin. We must know that it's a personal response that's needed. But most importantly, we need to also confront the reality of Jesus. We want to have living water. We need to confront the reality of Jesus. You see, he's the, he's the one that makes this all possible. And we can understand our sin and we can say, I want to make a personal response. But if we don't confront Jesus and see that it's in him and him alone, we may run off for somebody else. And we may, be, we may be very penitent and we may be very sincere, but we can still be very wrong. So we need to come to Jesus. And this is what she, this woman's saying, hey, I'll listen to Christ. And Jesus says, okay, good. I'm glad you're listening to me because <laughs> I am the Christ. See, we can't deal with our own sin. We can't overcome it. We can't change it. We can't pay for it ourselves short of death. We can't improve upon it. We need a Savior, one who is more powerful and more perfect than we are and more powerful and perfect than sin itself. And, you know, none of us can truly trust in spirit and in truth in and of ourselves. We can't change our own heart. We can't do that without Jesus. Only he can make us brand new. That's what Paul talks about in 2 Corinthians, isn't it? Those who are in Christ, if anyone is in Christ, he is what? A new creation. What's the only way we're a new creation? Through Christ, through Jesus Christ. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. The reality is for this woman that the key to drinking this water and never thirsting again is sitting right in front of her. It's right there in front of her. She may have tried to distract and, 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 and dismiss the reality, 
But this statement by Jesus, she must confront. If she's truly thirsty, satisfaction is only through Jesus, the man who's right before her. Isn't that awesome? You see how Jesus is unpacking this? How he's leading her through her life to him. And for us in our world that we share the good news with, salvation and new life is before us as well. And it's waiting in the person of Jesus Christ. He's the one that makes all of this work and all of this worthwhile. So when we confront this reality of sin, we realize, you know, we're not enough in and of ourselves. When we confront the reality of personal experience, we discover that we need to decide. We have a personal responsibility in our salvation. We don't save ourselves, but we have a personal responsibility to receive it. And when we confront these things, we're left with needing to experience and trust something and someone outside of ourselves. Because we can't do either of these things. Anything about either of these things. We need someone outside of ourselves, someone greater. Jesus is there. He's waiting, right, to be the life and salvation for us, to be forgiveness of sin for us. He says, I will forgive your sins. So yes, come to the reality of your sins. As bad as it is, it's nothing compared to my power to forgive. I want to believe. I want to do this. But I'm tied with all this stuff. You don't need that stuff, that baggage. You come to me and I will give you rest. I will give this to you. Jesus is the one. Jesus is the focus of all of this, right? He alone can bring salvation. He alone can satisfy our thirst so that in him we need nothing else. And that's what he's telling this woman at the well. This, and, and that's what she learns. And what we learn is this. If we were to summarize this passage in one sentence, it's this. Our thirst is quenched when we surrender our sin to our Savior. You want to know how we get living water? We surrender, which means we personally, we have a personal response of surrendering our sin to our Savior, who is Jesus and Jesus alone. And you know, if you're here this morning, you can do that today. You can surrender your sin, surrender your life to your Savior, the only one who can truly save, truly give life, truly give joy and hope and peace despite our failures, despite our sin, is Jesus. And there aren't hoops to go through. You don't have to go walk somewhere special. You don't have to, you know, do a ritual or anything like that. You know what you need to do? We need to ask. And we ask him. We say, Jesus, I know I can't make this, but I know you can save me. It can be as simple as that. Be my Lord and Savior. And what happens when we do that is, is, is he comes and makes us new. And then we begin to grow on what, what all that means. And what all it means is even more than we can possibly imagine. And it's better than we can possibly imagine. And we start to grow in him. And you can do that this morning as I pray. You can be praying on your own and ask God to do that. But next week, this, this, this incident at the well kind of continues. Now, his conversation with the woman is kind of done, but now it, it grows, and his disciples come back, and they kind of come upon this scene that is more than they can possibly imagine what just happened. We just went for food, and all this happened, and we're going to get to see that next week as we continue at the well. But for this week, know this. Our thirst is quenched when we surrender our sin to our Savior. And that's Jesus' message for this woman and for us this morning. Let's pray.